The expressed views, statements, and opinions by the guests on the Risk Advisor program made either during the show or on the corresponding social media and blog outlets are not necessarily the view or opinions of Baxter Productions, Inc. or any of its affiliates, associates, or others who are part of this production. Information provided during this broadcast is for news purposes only and does not constitute a remedy for any of the discussed risks presented. Did you ever open your credit card statement and see a charge that you didn't make? We've all been there. Today, we will learn what identity theft is, how it happens, and what you can do to protect yourself on this episode of the RiskAdvisor.com vodcast. The Risk Advisor. You're listening to the Risk Advisor vodcast. The Risk Advisor highlights topics about the most important personal security and safety issues today. This is for you, your family, and your loved ones. Experts alert to trends, tactics, and techniques used against us. You can be more aware and more informed to stay safe in this ever-changing, complicated place we call life. And now your host, media's go-to guy, Sal LaFriere. Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com vodcast. We're with John Bandler, the author of Cybersecurity for Home and Office, talking about identity theft, what people need to do to not become a victim. John, welcome back to the show. Sal, great to be here. Okay, identity theft. Um, I know we talked about it in a prior show a little bit, but what was, what was the background? How did you wind up doing this? So when I started at the Manhattan DA's office, after I had a couple years in, I started doing felonies and I became part of the brand new identity theft unit, which Mr. Morgenthau created. And I started working identity theft cases, small and some very large. In your book, you talk about cybercrime and identity theft. What's What's the crossover between those two? So the crossover is that cyber criminals hack lots of data. They do data breaches. And they take out millions of credit card numbers, millions of um, records of personal information, of names, birth dates, social security numbers. Those cyber criminals might be in another country, like Eastern Europe, and then they're going to sell that data. And who are they going to sell it to? A lot of times they're selling it to an identity thief right back here in the U.S. So if our credit card numbers are stolen, they're not going to be used to do a charge in Russia or Ukraine or wherever else because the credit card company is going to say, no, you don't go to those countries. We're not going to approve that charge. So the data is hacked. It's sold back to identity thieves right here in the United States. And then that identity thief is going to use our credit card, try to open up an account in our name. And that's the connection. They work together hand in hand and they pay each other and all of that. So the motivation in this, I'm going to assume, is like most evils, it's money. Yeah, most of cybercrime, most of identity theft, it's for profit. It's criminals trying to make money through theft. It's greed, uh, all of that. So tell us a little about the schemes that they work. What are the types of schemes that they're doing? So for identity theft, I like to put it mostly in two buckets. One is account takeovers. And the other is account openings. So we all have credit accounts, financial accounts. Uh, There's either credit that could be extended to us or we have money in our accounts. So an account takeover is going to be an identity thief trying to pretend he is us, that that account is his or hers, and they're going to try to run up our credit card bill or drain the contents of our bank account. Then an account opening is an identity thief pretending to be us, uh, trying to use the credit that we have to open up a new account to charge, make charges, uh, steal, get property. So you see commercials today talking about, you know, c- companies will come out and they'll do this, you know, deep web, dark web search for you to find out where it is. Can you talk a little bit about what really is the dark web, deep web, and th- does that really exist? Definitely. Yeah, it does exist. And just a quick caution that with all fraud, then there's uh, businesses trying to make money on our fear. Some of those businesses are good, some not so good. 
But to your question on the deep web and dark web, so deep web is basically any part of the internet that is not indi indexed by these search engines like so Google. So like a Google or any of the other. Right. So there's lots in the deep web that is not nefarious. So most companies, a lot of their internal internets are not indexed by search engines. So technically, that's the deep web. So there's lots of websites that have uh, private content. You have to be a member. You have to be paid. Technically, that's part of the deep web. And then the dark web is something that comes with Tor or the Onion Router. And that's the Onion Router is an invention that helps anonymize websites and people on the internet. And it became publicized with the Silk Road case where they had on the dark web, they had the Silk Road marketplace where people could buy and sell drugs and other contraband. So I don't know how much we want to get into the technical aspects of Tor, but basically when you're on the regular internet and you go to a website like CNN, you know where CNN is pretty much, and CNN knows where you are because they're talking to each other through, you each have your own IP address, internet protocol address. Tor, the onion router, is basically a system of proxies so that the person you're talking to on the internet doesn't know where exactly you are because you're not talking direct with them. You're going through four or five or six different hops to get there. So a lot of people, there's legitimate uses for Tor. In fact, it was started by the U.S. government to give uh, journalists and people in repressed countries more privacy in how they surf the web. And let's also remember that bad things were happening on the Internet long before Tor. Ever since criminals uh, started doing what they started doing, which is the beginning of humanity, they've always been trying to do things in secret. So nothing too new about that. So it just gives them the ability to remain anonymous. It helps them. It's now, from a tool. law enforcement perspective, that's got to be somewhat problematic because it's, because it's anonymized, you can't track back to where they are. It's... Uh, it's a tool to be anonymous and they've always been using tools and before tour they were using their secret websites that you were hard to get into it was hard for law enforcement to get into they're using nicknames they're using a lot of techniques to remain anonymous it's always been a challenge it's always going to be a challenge uh, because criminals by their nature are uh, secretive they don't want law enforcement to know who they are that's true so Let's talk about personal information that's available and for sale. How does that wind up out there? I mean, it just, I know there's a scam that's going on now where you're getting, we're getting emails that come in that says it, it comes to your email and it'll say that it'll have a password that, you know, you've used, you know, 10, 15 years ago and say, we have your password, we're able to get into your system, we know that you're looking at porn, and if you don't pay us $20,000 or you know, 5000 it all depends on who's, on who's soliciting you, you get these, you get, you get it, and then you, you know, they, they want you to go through Bitcoin and pay them. Where do they get this information from? How does all this come about? Great question, and that fraud you're mentioning, it's a sort of a sextortion fraud, and they added a new you know, it's an old fraud, and they added a new twist by providing this person's old password. So password, stores of passwords have been hacked from LinkedIn, Yahoo, uh, and criminals are able to, uh, you know, it's a big database of everybody's passwords. They're able to unravel that and use that to kind of trick people into thinking they have more information than they might. Now, that being said, our data is being compiled and tracked. These credit reporting companies, mm -hmm. they compile data about all of us to decide whether to issue credit or not. And people, people can buy those credit reports if you have a legitimate pur purpose. And criminals have hacked those reports. And then we've had all these data breaches over the years where cyber criminals hack and they get financial information, they get personal information, and then they resell it on the dark web or deep web or other through their capitalist marketplace they resell it so I think it is fair to say all of our information has been compiled by credit reporting companies 
There's been data breaches of our information from hundreds or thousands or more of companies that are holding data about us. And criminals are looking for ways to ledger, leverage that uh, either to commit identity theft or to extort us by tricking us into thinking something is the case when it's not. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about steps to remain safe in this cyber world. Workplace violence, terrorism, identity theft, cyberbullying, and stalking. It's not a matter of if they will happen. It's a matter of when. The security world is too complicated to do it alone. You need a security advisor. Call Protective Countermeasures now. Protective Countermeasures has been providing security consulting to Fortune 500 companies for nearly 20 years. Call today. 914-576-8706. ProtectiveCountermeasures.com. You're watching the Risk Advisor Vodcast, and we're back with John Bandler, the author of Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. Today we're talking about identity theft and what people need to do to remain secure. So, John, during the break, we, we chatted a little bit about what would wind up happening. Um, companies that are out there, we, talk, well, we talked about you know, the deep web and service. There were companies out there, you mentioned uh, credit monitoring services. You talked about you know, credit, doing credit reports. So talk to us a little <coughs> bit about those credit monitoring services. What's the, you know, what are some of the risks that we run into with them? So some of those services are not always a great value. So some companies are playing on our fear. Uh, so what I like to tell people, there's a lot of things they can do that don't cost them any money. Like they can put a credit freeze in place so that no one can use their credit without their authorization. And so I, I would just say be careful with the credit monitoring services. Uh, they're not always a great value. It, you know, it's funny because everything today that you see is for free, is never really for free, right? It's always a, there's always a cost associated with it. And when someone, when you see the commercial saying, we're going to scan the deep web for your information and tell you how much at risk you are, I'm going to do it for free. Why are they doing it for free? And it's just a matter of, at least my opinion of it, is it's, a matter, it's just the capability of them to get more information on you. Because you gotta, you have to actually sit down and give them the information that you want them to scan for. So you're gonna have to give them your social security number for them to scan it. And I, I think that's, you know, that's just one of those things that's sort of problematic. Yeah, it's certainly a, a risk whenever you're giving information. And then when they scan the web for your information, chances are good our information is out there. So I would say assume your information is out there, that the criminals have it. Uh, and then once they find that and tell you, guess what? Now it's going to cost you $19.99 a month to uh, monitor that. Monitor. So just assume your information is out there. Take steps to protect your identity, and it probably won't cost you anything. How about repairing your credit? So you, were, you became a victim of, a, of an identity theft. How do you repair your credit? So... We have laws that protect us, so if there's an error on your credit, you have the right to have that be corrected, and that requires notifying the credit companies. Now, there are companies that also sell the service to you, uh, but you you got to be wary because sometimes, I mean, every company is there to make a profit. Sometimes they're taking advantage of people who have bad credit and not necessarily fixing their credit. But there is a law that if your credit uh, report is inaccurate, they're required to correct it. How about taking stuff off of the web? So taking stuff off the web uh, is very difficult. Obviously, if it's in the dark web and criminals have it, no one can request to the criminals, hey, could you give my data back or could you delete it and take it down? They're not going to listen. Now, there's other places on the web where you have these reputation management companies, and they may claim to be able to get things removed from the web and pressure people to remove it. How successful those are, um, I'm not so sure. You mentioned in the book and in, and in conversations that we had in you know, pre-production pre, pre meetings about phone accounts being important. Tell us a little about that. So now our cell phones are becoming more and more important because, well, as I mentioned in the last show, uh, 
A lot of times we're using our phones for multi-factor authentication to improve the security of our online accounts by proving that we have possession of a phone. So we get a text message to our phone. Uh, we're using phones all over the place. That's how people contact us and uh, store us in their databases. So it's becoming more and it's, it's becoming a part of our identity. So we have to be a little bit careful about that and also make sure that hackers cannot steal our phone account. There's actually a case of that. Uh, some guy had a lot of Bitcoin, used his phone to help secure it, and someone took over his account. They went into the store and said, I lost my phone. Can you give me a, a replacement phone? And they impersonated the guy and lost a couple million dollars. Oh, that'll hurt. After a while, it becomes real money. <laughs> So explain to the audience, why does a guy like me as a security expert advise people, especially when they have infants, when they have young children, I advise them, okay, you got to get credit monitoring on the child right away. And they look at you like you're a little crazy and they come on, really, you're a little paranoid. Why is that important? So here they are. You have a new person and uh, potentially building a credit record, the financial companies are eventually going to want to uh, l loan credit money to this uh, kid. So criminals now, a new trend, is they're assuming the identity of infants. They'll assume the identity of anyone if it'll get them credit. So some well, people... You hear the story about the dogs getting credit. So, you know, credit card shows up in the mail for a dog. Sure. So, yeah. And there's a type of scam, uh, synthetic identity fraud, where Basically, they're not assuming a person's identity. They're kind of creating a new identity that gets credit. So even monitoring can sometimes, if you're paying a service, obviously that costs. You can request that free credit report annually for the child. You can also put a credit freeze on for the child. And now a credit freeze by law is free and the three credit reporting agencies must do it. So you could freeze your infant's credit so that no one can damage it until they become of age to start using it responsibly. That's a, that's a great tip. Quickly before we go to break, credit cards, debit cards, everybody wants you to pay by debit card these days. You recommend paying by credit card. Why? So if you're responsible with your credit and you can use a credit card well, you're more protected with credit card. And if there's fraud... Uh, Let's face it, every time you use a payment method, it could be compromised. So the more you use your debit card, the more chance it could be compromised. And think what happens if your debit card is compromised. Criminal makes a charge, $400, $4,000 out of your bank account. It's gone from you. Now you got to go to the bank and say, this was fraud, give me my money back. And then the bank decides what to do, and maybe you get your money back. But with a credit card... Someone puts a $4,000 charge on your credit card, you get the statement, you tell the bank, I'm not paying this, this is fraud, and by law, you're not obligated to pay it. So credit card puts you in much better position. You're not bouncing checks, you're able to make your rent, you're able to pay because the money has not been taken from your bank account. Good to know. Good, good to know. Hi, right, when we come back, we're going to talk about some steps to remain safe from identity theft. And we'll be right back after the break. From the files of New York detective Frank Santasola comes a riveting murder mystery novel, The Garbage Murders. After an illicit liaison with his mistress, the owner of a private sanitation company in New York is murdered. His wife, aware of the affair, first believes it could be the motivation for the killing. But when her truck drivers are attacked by her husband's associates, family values get questioned. Enter the life of Detective Frank Miranda, one of a few men in law enforcement assigned to infiltrate the Italian mob and bring to justice some of the biggest names in organized crime history. Be taken into the world of an infiltrator and the personal decisions and sacrifices he made daily. Guaranteed to touch all your emotions, sadness, anger, love, and laughter. Available on Amazon Books in both paperback and Kindle editions. TheGarbageMurders.com You're watching the Risk Advisor podcast, and we're back with John Bandler, the author of Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. 
We're going to talk about cybercrime and what people need to do to remain safe and secure online. In today's episode, specifically, we're talking about identity theft and going into that, you know, what we I think what we really need here is to understand some really good practices of how do we keep our privacy and how do we keep our our cyber information secure. So what are your recommendations? Definitely. So good cybersecurity is important. Good privacy awareness is important. Uh, you want to get your free annual credit report every year. It's free. doesn't cost anything. You can see if anything's inappropriate there and get it uh, corrected. Uh, any improper charges, you want to correct that. Uh, you want to be careful what you throw out in the trash. Uh, you never know who's going through your trash. So you don't want to throw out your old checks, your banking statements, uh, personal information. You want to make it hard for the thief who might be going through your trash. So, Do you find most people don't take the time to look through their statements? You know, I, I, and, I, and I see it's... It, I see it could, it, it's a very easy habit to get into when you do the automatic payment. So if if you have a charge card that's coming in and you're automatically paying it or, you know, a gas bill or electric bill or you tell, whatever, um, an automatic payment, it's out of sight, out of mind. Do you find that? Yeah, I think that's true. And I think there are some frauds that, you know, they'll put a recurring charge on your credit card of a couple dollars or more and... Some people may not notice it. And, you know, there's a saying, if, if you steal a dollar from a million people, the, no one will report it or notice it, and that's the way to go. So I'm sure a lot of that happens. You know, it's funny when you start looking at, you start paying attention to it, um, and you realize the $3 charges, the $5 charges, the, re, the recurring $5 charges. The thing now where you get uh, people, services, will the automatic renewals, Something popped up the other day in an email that I got, and it said that it was automatically renewing, and I'm, and I couldn't remember what I was automatically renewing, and it was something that I had purchased two years ago. Uh, so it's it, it's just easy to fall, you know to fall prey to that. It's not necessarily that it's you know somebody doing something you know maliciously. It's just the service, and it, it's, it's a, for them. It's a great way to market it, and a great way to you know to sell their service and get recurring revenue. But it, um, you talked about the getting the annual credit reports. Where can people get their credit report from? So it's annualcreditreport.com, and by law, the three credit reporting agencies they participate in that website, and you can get one free credit report from each of them. Now. Uh, it's annualcreditreport.com. If you search for it, you're going to find 100 sites trying to get you to go to that site. But you want to make sure you go to the right authorized site to get your free credit reports. It doesn't cost anything. Talk, talking about you know, being online and cyber information uh, and locking things down, let's talk about social media for a bit. Um, we see from our end of it, we see a lot of people getting themselves in trouble. We deal a lot with cyberbullying. We get to deal a lot with stalking cases. Um, we see stuff going on in high schools and in middle schools that are real problematic. And more importantly, we see a lot of problems with parents uh, who would wind up, and a lot of times wind up in more trouble than the kids do. Talk to us about social media. What should we be aware of? What should we be secure? worrying about so i think social media i think everyone in the family needs to be conscious of what they're sharing to the world and what they're doing online and it really starts by looking at your privacy and security settings on each social media site so there's a lot of people that do not realize that the posts they're sharing are visible to the entire world and look if you decide that that's how you want it to be that's totally fine but if you don't realize that the posts you think are for your friends are really visible to the world, then I think you need to think a little bit more about privacy because some people need to worry about stalking. You know, you want to think about your kids. Might they be stalked? Might a predator want to do research on them? So you want to think about this privacy and security level on their social media sites. You obviously don't want your social media account being hacked either. And you got to think that the people you're connected to, the people you think are your friend, maybe their account might be hacked. 
And, you know, then the hacker can play all kinds of schemes to manipulate people into doing things they shouldn't do, like sharing inappropriate pictures, uh, extorting them, blackmailing them, bullying them. So I th think we all, parents and kids, need to pay attention to what we're doing online and make sure it's appropriate and safe. In the last couple of minutes that we have, um, you know, one of the cases we had talked about briefly was Equifax with a data breach. Maybe not necessarily so much about the case, but what about if you get notified, if you get that letter that your identity may have been compromised or something that, that a company was hacked, the service that you're using has been hacked, what should you do? So Equifax, I think, is the biggest breach uh, up until now, or maybe there's been a bigger one since then, but about 150 million people had their records compromised. And, you know, it's because of poor information security. Who knows who has all that data now, but we should assume it's out there. Uh, now, Equifax, I think, is offering uh, uh, free credit monitoring services, whether that's worth it as a free service to take or not, uh, I guess would be debatable, but we have to assume that our information is out there. And I think it's a little bit of a wake up call for people about uh, privacy and credit and you know what, who should be holding our data and making money from it. It's true. We've been talking to John Bandler, the author of Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. Um, just a an, an excellent book. When, as I said to him earlier, when I got the thing in the mail and looking at it, I'm saying, "Oh man, is a textbook. I'm not going to be able to get through this." Uh, but in reality, it it really does read. It was written for the average man, but someone with no technical capability, and it, it literally takes you through step by step. And uh, it's it's actually something I would highly recommend. Thank you, Sal. It's one of those books that you know you want to you want to keep handy because you're going to ask yourself those questions. You know, what do I do now? And it's a, it's a great reference book. So with that, John, thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. I'd like to remind you that if you have a question for John or you have a comment about us, that uh, you can write to us at the guest at the risk advisor dot com, or you can follow us on our social media accounts, and you can find all of that on our website riskadvisor.com. Again, we'd like to thank you for watching and we hope to see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you have any questions, would like to appear on the program or recommend a guest, contact us at theriskadvisor.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. View and listen to us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Roku TV. Tune in live on various local radio stations. Find links to all of these and listen to past shows at theriskadvisor.com. Thank you for listening. Stay safe and join us again next week for another episode of The Risk Advisor.